Second major trend I want to lay out with, the rise of the Church of Martyrs. Church of Martyrs. Uh, when I did my book, The Future Church, uh, back in 2009, so what is that, six years ago, uh, I kicked off ten megatrends that at that time I saw shaping Catholic life. This wasn't on the list, uh, but if I had that book to do over again, uh, this megatrend clearly would be on the list and would have a, price, a pride of place, because I'm convinced that the most dramatic, the most terrible, the most compelling Catholic story, for that matter, Christian story of our time, is the rise of what I have described in a separate book as the global war on Christians. Global war on Christians. By that, I mean the rise of systematic, widespread, anti-Christian discrimination, persecution, and violence in a staggering number of places in the world. Now, let me start with a couple of caveats. Okay? First, Obviously, Christians are not the only people suffering in the world today. Okay? All kinds of groups, whether it's defined by religion or, in, or something else, uh, face hardships and persecution and discrimination, often on a lethal scale. Christians have no monopoly on martyrdom. And second, if our concern for anti-Christian discrimination uh, and persecution is going to mean anything, it has to be a principled concern for religious freedom and human rights around the board, across the board. If this comes off as a narrow, confessional concern solely for Christians or solely for Catholics, it will be dead upon arrival. Okay? But if we're going to get anything done, we have to do it with coalitions and we have to be seen uh, as promoting uh, the human rights and the dignity of all, not simply our own. Okay. Now, those things said, uh, I nevertheless believe that, that it is important <coughs> that we focus for a moment specifically on anti-Christian discrimination and persecution, because I believe <clears throat> that unique in the Western imagination, it is a story that struggles to be heard. Okay? It is very easy for the typical American or the typical European to believe that a Jew, for example, might suffer religious persecution, or that a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu <clears throat> might suffer religious persecution. It is much more difficult for that typical American or European to instinctively, at the gut level, imagine that the same thing can happen to Christians. Because our narrative in the West for centuries uh, has been that Christianity is the big kid on the block, right? It's the largest uh, religious institution. It's socially powerful. Historically, it's had all kinds of privileges <coughs> and protection by the state, uh, and on and on. I mean, if you say religious persecution to the typical American or the typical Western, Okay. I imagine that the first thing that's going to flash in your minds are things like the Crusades, right? And the wars of religion, and the Salem witch trials, and you know, all of these chapters of history in which Christianity was actually the bad guy, right? The persecute poor, not the persecute team. Okay? Well, ladies and gentlemen, part of what the rise of the world church means uh, is that that narrative about where Christianity stands in terms of its exposure to the risk of persecution has badly exceeded its cell value. Huh? I mean, it just doesn't quite make sense. But here's the reality. As I said, we live in a world in which uh, two-thirds of the Catholics, and it's also true of Christians generally, there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world, uh, and two-thirds of Christians generally uh, live outside the West. They often live in neighborhoods uh, where religious freedom is more honored than the breach or than the observance. 200 million uh, of those Christians live in places where they are social minorities, okay, uh, and therefore uh, exposed to all kinds of, of difficulties. But even in places where Christians are an overwhelming majority, that doesn't mean the situation is risk-free. Let me run the numbers for you. The high end estimate for the number of Christians killed every year in the early 21st century for reasons related to their faith comes to us from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Here in the States. The high end estimate from Todd Johnson, the lead researcher there at Gordon Conwell, is that 100,000 Christians every year are killed for reasons related to their religious beliefs. That is, he estimates there are 100,000 new Christian martyrs every year, and he believes that has been true every year uh, since the dawn of the 21st century. Now, others regard that uh, estimate uh, as significantly inflated. Uh, they think it, it mixes together too many apples and oranges kinds of situations. 
probably the low-end estimate uh, comes to us in the World Council of Churches, which holds that there are roughly 7,000 to 8,000 Christians killed for reasons related to the faith every year. Now think for a minute about what that range gives us. High-end 100,000, low-end 8,000. What that means, what that means, is that somewhere in the world, a Christian is being killed for religious motives either every five minutes or once every hour. Okay? Either every five minutes or once every hour. No matter which, uh, which end of the spectrum ends up being closer to the truth, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you that is a human rights scourge of dumbfounded proportions. Okay. Dumbfounded proportions. Uh, some other statistical measures. Uh, according to the Center, the Strategic Center for the Study of Terrorism in the Pentagon, violent anti-Christian terrorist acts increased 139% uh, in the period from uh, the year 2000 to the year 2013. 139%. Okay. Uh, according to the Frankfurt-based International Society for uh, Human Rights, which is, by the way, not a religious outfit, it is a secular NGO, According to the former chairman of that group, 80% of all acts of religious discrimination in the world today, that's 8-0, 80% of all acts of religious discrimination in the world today are directed against Christians. Christians are, by far, statistically speaking, by far, the world's most persecuted, most discriminated against religious community. Okay? Now, those, I think those numbers are compelling uh, on their own. But I think what truly brings this story home is when you drill down below the numbers, okay, to the personal stories underneath it. Uh, in the months before the Pope's visit to the States, so basically from May through August, I and a colleague from Crux took a reporting trip uh, to five countries to try to document these stories uh, of the new Christian martyrs. So we went to, to Latin America, uh, initially to cover the beatification of Archbishop Oscar Bernardo, the great uh, Salvadoran martyr in 1980. Then we went to Colombia. Colombia, by the way, uh, has the distinction uh, of being uh, the most dangerous place on the planet to be a Catholic priest. Since 1984, two bishops, 85 priests, eight men and women religious, 12 seminarians have all been killed in Colombia as part of that country's long-running civil war. It's the longest-running civil war on the face of the planet, uh, more than 60 years now. Uh, peace talks are currently underway in Havana. We'll see whether or not there is a deal, but in the meantime, people are still being killed. And the church has been part of that, that story. So we are in Colombia. We then went to Egypt, uh, we went to India, and we ended up in Nigeria. And I want to tell you just three very brief stories people we met along the way. And bear in mind, the stories I'm about to describe to you are not rare. They are not exceptional. They are not one-off outliers. Okay? For each of these stories, you could multiply them a thousand times, ten thousand times, hundreds of thousands of times, and you would come up with the Christian narrative of our time. So let me start in Colombia. We met a bishop by the name of Misael Baca Ramirez who's the bishop of a small rural diocese. We met him in Bogota because that's where his family lives. And by the way, this guy was Pope Francis way before Pope Francis was Pope Francis, okay? In terms of simplicity and humility and all of that. We pull up to his family home, which by the way is in a working class neighborhood that you really have to want to find this place in order to get there. I mean, GPS failed, we had to stop like 19 times to get directions. Finally, we pull up Okay, uh, and I'm bounding out of the van. Uh, and there's this guy who I'm assuming is the doorman, right? Because he's wearing these like dungarees and this like cut off, you know, sort of jacket and so on. Uh, and I walk up and say, hey, uh, you know, sorry, uh, we're here to see His Excellency Bishop Ramirez. And he's like, I'm Bishop Ramirez. Huh? Uh, and then, you know, he took us into this extremely modest uh, sort of a uh, home where, where 18 members of his family are living in three rooms. I mean, it utterly blows you away. Uh, and, and we were sitting in a room for him to tell us the story of what had happened to him uh, in 2007 when he was kidnapped uh, and held at gunpoint for seven days uh, by a band of guerrillas from one of uh, Colombia's two main uh, guerrilla movements, left-wing guerrilla movements in this case. 
Uh, there's the FARC, which is the principal uh, guerrilla movement, and then there's the ELN. Uh, interestingly, the ELN has a kind of Catholic backstory. It was uh, originally founded uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, in part by uh, Catholic priests who were linked to the liberation theology movement. And at that time, it was a political protest movement. It sort of morphed into being an armed guerrilla struggle along the way. Anyway, Bishop Vaca Ramirez was kidnapped by these guys because he and a group of catechists had been active uh, in an area that was under the guerrilla's control, trying to persuade people to stop the violence. Okay? Not trying to persuade them to side with the government over the guerrillas, just saying, listen, you know, there are all these paramilitary groups of left and right and on and on, and none of this is doing any good. So what we want to do is help you give your children alternatives to being swept up in the violence. Okay? We want to give them vocational training that will let them find jobs. So they don't end up, uh, you know, either joining one of these great wing paramilitary outfits or one of the left wing guerrilla movements. Uh, for their trouble, uh, several uh, catechists in, in Ramirez's diocese had been shot to death, uh, often in grotesque fashion, uh, or killed in other ways. One of them had their heads cut off, and their body was dumped in, this, in the central square of the village in this diocese. The head was placed in the person's lap. Uh, and around what was left of the net, they had run a cardboard sign with uh, written in this person's own blood, this is what happens when you mess with us. Okay? That's the pastoral reality that Bishop Baca Ramirez has to deal with okay, on a fairly constant basis. So when he was kidnapped, it was him, his vicar general, who was traveling with him because he was making parish visits, him, his vicar general, uh, and three or four of the catechists who were moving him. And the guerrillas, at one point, put guns to the heads of these catechists and insisted that Vaca Ramirez uh, renounce any further activity, promised that he would leave his diocese and never come back, or they were going to shoot these people. Okay, and Vaca Ramirez was then faced with this sort of agonizing choice in conscience of what do I do? Now, eventually, before he had to make a decision, the guerrilla leader stepped in and said, okay, we're not going to kill anyone today, but we want you to know what's on the tape. Now, halfway through telling this story, Vaca Ramirez broke down in tears and was simply unable to continue, unable to continue the narrative. He, he, he couldn't finish it. So we, I and my translator, waited about, I don't know, 20 minutes for something uh, to allow him to compose himself. And then I said, listen, let's forget the interview. Let's, let's just sit down and talk. Okay, um, and I asked him, was he reliving the horror of those days? Is that why, and had he had a flashback, is that why he had become so seen? And he told me, no, what was bothering him was basically what we in English would call survivors. He said, ever since then, I've had to ask myself, he said, you know, this war has cost the lives of 212,000 people, according to official government estimates. 92,000 Colombians have simply disappeared without a trace. So why am I a lot you know, and all of those people have died? Okay. And then he started telling stories. He had been a close friend of a Colombian bishop by the name of Pablo Milo, uh, who had been kidnapped himself 10 years before and wasn't so fortunate. He was shot to death by bullets, and his body was tossed in the local river. Okay, so Vaca Ramirez was also saying, why am I alive when my friend Jaime is dead? That's his pastoral reality. Okay. And that's the Church of the Martyrs. Okay, second story. When we went to uh, Egypt, we met a doctor by the name of Wadi Ramses. Uh, Ramses is a Coptic Christian. I mean, therefore, Orthodox, so the Coptic Church. There was a Coptic Catholic and a Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt. Coptic Orthodox is by far the largest. You can always tell a Copt, by the way, because they have these tattoos, these small uh, tattoos of the Coptic cross on their right wrist, which is actually a form of ID. Okay? You cannot get into the Coptic church in Egypt these days without flashing your tattoo or having somebody to vouch for you for security reasons. Okay. Now, Christians in Egypt, of course, uh, have been getting kicked in the teeth ever since the so-called uh, Arab Spring uh, took place, which turned into a kind of Christian nightmare. Uh, you know, thousands have been killed, tens of thousands have been driven into internal exile, uh, thousands have fled the country, and so forth and so on. Uh, they are sort of a, a hostile prisoner of war, if you like, uh, in the tensions between the Egyptian army uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the country's largest opposition movement. 
and, uh, and Christians often get swept up. They're convenient targets uh, for people on either side of that animosity who need to vent their frustrations about what's happened. We met a guy by the name of Nabil Solomon. Nabil is 52. Uh, prior to the Arab Spring, uh, he was living with his family, his family meaning his wife, Sabil, uh, his five sons, and about 12 grandkids. Uh, they were living in a village in Upper Egypt, which, oddly enough, I didn't realize until I visited, Upper Egypt is actually below Lower Egypt. It's a very confusing thing. Um, but uh, in any event, in the south of Egypt, which is up, okay, um, he was living in a rural village, well, village, I mean, it was a town of like 17,000 people or something like that. And, it, he was the one Christian who was uh, authorized by the mayor to be part of the local security force. So he's the only Christian in town who had a permit to carry a gun, basically. And it, it was a position of some trust. And the family was very proud of it. All right, flash forward to 2013, uh, when the Arab Spring starts. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood takes power in Egypt. Then in 2014, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood falls, right? It's kicked out by another popular, uh, well, fueled by a popular uprising, although it was technically decapitated by the army. When the Muslim Brotherhood government fell, the Muslim, the sympathizers of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in this village decided to take out their rage on the local Christians, and the guy at the top of their list was, of course, Nabil, because he was the only one who could shoot back, right? So he was the first guy they went after. Uh, he was guarding the post office at the time. This crowd of radicals showed up. They drove him out into the street, began obviously disarming him, began beating him up. This went on for about a half hour until the actual police force in the city showed up and joined the beating, okay, rather than preventing it. Uh, so they started getting their kicks in. Meanwhile, simultaneously, another mob had gone to Solomon's house and burned it to the ground with his wife and kids inside. Now, they managed to escape, okay? But they burned his house to the ground. His wife rented the mayor and begged for help. The mayor said, I'm powerless to do anything about it. So she then ran to the central street where her husband was being beaten and, and essentially flung herself on top of his body to try to stop it. So eventually, the police then took him into custody inviting onlookers to spit at him and kick him as they led him back to the station house. Okay, they took him into the station house and said, all right, we've got two choices for you. Either one, you and your entire family leaves here and never comes back, or we are going to charge you with the murder uh, of this well-known local thug. The thug, by the way, was killed in another town 70 kilometers away. At the time, everyone knew Solomon was in his hometown. I mean, it was physically impossible for him to have done it. But they said, you know, we've got people who are willing to come forward and testify in history, so we're going to make this stick. And by the way, just so you know, the threat is real. Even once you leave, we are not going to withdraw the charge. So if you ever set foot back in here, that charge will still be hanging over you. So he and his entire family, penniless, by the way, because their home has been destroyed, their property has been destroyed, the city uh, has refused to pay off his pension because in their eyes he's being fired for cause, the cause in this case largely that he's a Christian. Okay? Uh, so they fled to Cairo. Uh, all of them, so basically 19 people, the husband and wife, five, uh, five kids, 12 grandkids, all of them are living in a three-room apartment in one of the poorest and most god-awful neighborhoods of Cairo. We went and visited them in their home. Basically, the options in this place are, you either leave the window open, okay, in which case flies from the open sewage right outside the window make their home. I mean, it's like being in a scene from the Book of Exodus. Okay? I'm not talking about one or two annoying flies. I'm talking about swarms. Okay? Or you close the window and you get baited to death by the stifling Cairo heat. They have, they have no uh, indoor plumbing. They have no electricity. Okay? And they're barely hanging on. And here's the kicker. Solomon is also one of roughly 10 million uh, Egyptians uh, who suffers from hepatitis C, which is a treatable but chronic condition. And because he's lost all his money, and only two of the kids were able to make any money at all uh, selling secondhand clothes in the street. Uh, he could no longer afford the drug regimen needed to treat that hepatitis C. 
So he is quite literally waiting to die. Okay, he is sitting in that apartment like, like Job from the Old Testament, okay, contemplating the staggering misfortunes that have fallen upon him, and simply marking days off the calendar. I mean, quite literally for him, being a Christian in Egypt in 2014 is a death sentence. A death sentence, okay, in the literal sense of the term. A death sentence. And when I ask him, at any stage along the way, were you tempted to just throw in the towel and say, look, okay, uh, you know, the price of being a Christian in this country is too high, okay, uh, and I'm going to at least go through the motions of conversion to Islam in the hope that it would turn around my fortunes and, and those of my family to some extent. His answer was, I get down on my knees every day and I thank God for the grace of being able to suffer for this day. I get down on my knees every day and I thank God for the grace of being able to suffer for this day. Final story from India. We went to, uh, to uh, eastern India, uh, a district called Marissa, uh, where there's a, a place called Kanhamal. Uh, Kanhamal was the setting for the most vicious anti-Christian pogrom anywhere in the world uh, in the early 21st century. Uh, it took place in 2008. Uh, what had happened was uh, there was a local Hindu leader in the Asian may know was in the, the grip of a very strong form of Hindu nationalism these days. Um, it's governed by the Hindu, the political vein of the Hindu national movement, so is its district. Uh, in 2008, a, a local uh, Hindu holy man was shot dead. Uh, he was shot dead by Maoist guerrillas, actually. Uh, but the initial rumor mill blamed the assault on local Christians which triggered an orgy of violence, the likes of which you cannot possibly imagine. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, about 120 Christians were killed, uh, thousands were injured, 50,000 or so were driven into an exile in a nearby forest where they had to remain for months before they could return to their homes while in the forest. More of them died from starvation and snake bite. And when I say people were killed, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm in some ways underselling the drama of what we're talking about. I met one woman, for example, whose husband was among the victims of Kantamal. What had happened is that they were hiding in their home when the violence broke out. Uh, they decided to try to make a break for it, but they were caught. So she and her husband and their three small children were drugged into the central square uh, in the village. Her husband was tied to a post and beaten initially. Then uh, this band of Hindu radicals who were carrying torches and machetes and, and shouting slogans to Hindu deities and so on, uh, then they insisted that he renounce his Christianity and accept uh, what they would call reconversion to Hinduism because in their eyes, every authentic Indian was born Hindu. Okay, so you don't convert to Hinduism, you go back to your, your natural destiny. When he refused, uh, then they started to stone him. And when he refused again, they then took one of these machetes, cut open his stomach, ripped out his intestines, and put them around their necks like a kind of macabre wardrobe as they, as they forced his wife and children to watch him slowly bleed to death. And again, this is not an exceptional story. We collected anecdote after anecdote after anecdote of this sort of thing. Back with forensic autopsies. In other words, this is not urban legend. Okay, uh, this is these are things that actually happen and are continuing to happen. Anyway, one of the people we interviewed was a nun by the name of uh, a survey name, Sister Mina Barber. She's actually the sister of the Archbishop John Barber, who is now the Archbishop uh, in uh, in kind of Mall in our uh, She was in kind of Mall working at a social service center. Uh, when the violence broke out. She was there with a local priest by the name of Father Thomas Chena. The radicals burst into the center and drug both of them out into the street. Uh, they stripped Sister Nina naked. Uh, they put a gun to Chena's head, Father Chena, uh, and insisted that he rape her. Uh, when he refused, uh, they beat him. Uh, they thought they had beaten him to death. The only reason they stopped is because they thought he was dead. Uh, as it turns out, miraculously, he was comatose and he survived. 
Uh, several of these men then proceeded to rape Sister Nina. <clears throat> she doesn't actually know uh, the total number of assailants because at one stage during the attack she lost consciousness. She just knows it was more than one. By the way, uh, she, she can identify uh, at least one of her assailants uh, and has done so repeatedly uh, to police and prosecutors, but the guy has never been arrested. Uh, he's still walking around free in the streets of Panama Mall because the place is run uh, by a, a local government that is uh, in league uh, with the Hindu nationalists and has no interest in prosecuting things like this. Uh, but in any event, uh, so Sister Mina, and then after they were done raping her, they paraded her naked through the streets of the town uh, and essentially kept her captive for a full day uh, before letting her go. Uh, Sister Mina now, uh, she's now 37, um, she told me that she is now working on a law because she wants to be able to fight for other victims uh, of this kind of uh, human rights abuse. And I asked her, Sister Mina, what spiritual sense do you make of what happened to you? I mean, I get it how you process this on a human level and, and all of that, but I mean, spiritually, you must have asked yourself the question, you know, why would God let this happen? What, what answer had you come up with? And here's what she told me. She told me that because Jesus Christ was not a woman, there were certain kinds of violence and certain kinds of suffering he couldn't experience in his own body. And that she feels that God had given her the grace to, in a sense, complete the suffering of Christ for the salvation of the world. Okay, that's how she processes this spiritually. And again, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, I am not describing rare, exceptional cases. Okay. I'm talking about the kind of thing that is happening on a vast scale all over the world, 24-7, 365 days uh, a year. Okay. I'm convinced this is the premier human rights story of our time, that is the rise of this, this sort of tidal wave of anti-Christian hostility. Uh, it is the, and if it is the premier human rights story, it is certainly, I think, the premier Christian and Catholic story uh, of our time. Um, and while we may not be able to put a stop to this, uh, I do think uh, those of us who are privileged to live in places where we do not take our lives in our hands every time we go to Mass, or every time we go uh, to uh, a, a church event, those of us who live in a relative comfort and a relative insulation from that kind of risk, uh, I do think we face a serious serious call uh, to be in solidarity with our sisters and brothers in the faith around the world who are suffering. Now, I know that sounds abstract, and I know given the scale of suffering I've just sketched, it can seem too big to be on anyone's effort to, to affect. But let me give you one place where I think that can become real. I would suggest that there is any place in the Catholic Act right now where we Americans in particular have a special obligation to be engaged, it is Iraq. Iraq and Syria. Uh, it is a place where Christians are being slaughtered wholesale. You probably know that the, the ISIS offensive that was unleashed in the plains of Nineveh a year ago uh, killed an estimated 10 to 12,000 Christians, put about 100,000 to 200,000 Christians into either eternal exile or refugee status, along with Yazidis, uh, and so on. Why are we Americans called to life? Well, I don't think it requires a geopolitical genius to figure this one out. You know, whatever we make of the moral legitimacy of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, it is empirically undeniable that it was that intervention that ripped the lid off pre-existing sectarian tensions and created the context uh, in which Iraqi Christians today are walking around with bullseyes on their backs. And frankly, I think it is a source of some national shame that if you ask a typical Iraqi Christian today, they will tell you they have more faith in Vladimir Putin than in the United States to do anything concrete and meaningful on their behalf. I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Okay. Uh, and so I think that uh, we have both an opportunity and an obligation uh, to sort of step up to the plate here. And I'm, I, whether that means boots on the ground is another question. But we have an opportunity and an obligation to make sure that our suffering brothers and sisters in the faith, particularly those people in Iraq and Syria, who are suffering in part as a result of American foreign policy choices, 
But those people realize that we have not forgotten them and that we will be there, we'll, we will be there now in the immediate humanitarian crisis that they face and we will be there with them long term as they struggle to rebuild their church. Okay? Uh, and this story is not going to go away, it's not a one-off. That's why I tell you it's one of the megatrends of our time. So summing up, in trying to think about the Catholic Church today, uh, I, would, I would give you two sort of takeaways. One, to think clearly and carefully and intelligently about the Catholic Church. You've got to do it in a global key. And secondly, you've got to give credit place. You've got to give special emphasis to the suffering church. Because, ladies and gentlemen, whatever our interests, our concerns, our priorities may be, they are very real and they're important. And they deserve our last best ounce of effort to think our way through. But we are not risking life and limb. Okay, for nothing other than our profession of Christianity. A staggering number of our sisters and brothers in this world are. If that, folks, is not a mega trend, I'm not sure I've ever seen one. Okay, now listen, uh, we're at 11 o'clock. I know this has been a little heavy, and this, this last one was not exactly a like, party conversation. Okay, uh, so I want to end on a somewhat light note, uh, and then send you on your break. Light note is this. To stand up, to, to, to meet creatively the challenges I just described, we're gonna, it's going to require from all of us a sort of truckload of qualities. It's going to require perseverance and imagination and commitment and all of that. But let me give you one quality that I absolutely know has to be on the list, and without it, we're going to go bad and be wrong. Okay? And that quality is a lively sense of humor. Because if we can't occasionally laugh at ourselves and our circumstances, we're going to spend all of our time fighting down heartburn, and we all know that doesn't lead anywhere good. Now, the good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that you can find that lively sense of humor in this great big church of ours, sometimes in the most wildly unpredictable places. Okay, and I'm going to tell you one story to illustrate. This story is about the Pope, but not about Pope Francis. I mean, everybody would assume he's got a good sense of humor, but it's about Pope Benedict, who, as you know, uh, carried around a, in secular public opinion a somewhat disastrous narrative. Right? I mean, the kind of mythology about Benedict XVI was that he was the Darth Vader of the Catholic Church. Right? I mean, you know, whenever this picture would come up on CNN, they might as well have played the Imperial Death March from Star Wars, because that would capture how they're going to treat the poor guy, right? And yet, the truth is, the guy had a wicked sense of humor. And here's a story to illustrate. In 2005, uh, when John Paul died, and only had the conclave that elected the Benedict to the papacy, uh, you all know that whenever there's a major news event, uh, as sure as night follows day, there's going to be a cottage industry of Insta books looking to cash in and all the interest in that event, right? And the way I can prove this is that I participated in that cottage industry. Uh, I brought out my own Insta book called The Rise of Benedict XVI. Okay? Now, in the Vatican Press Quarter, there is a tradition uh, that when one of us publishes a book about the Holy Father, we inscribe a copy to and then we give it either to his priest secretary or to his spokesman or whatever, somebody in his inner circle, right, uh, as a kind of trigger. Now, to be honest, it had never entered my mind for a moment that the Pope would actually read these books. I mean, in my mind's eye, I had imagined a box in the basement of the Apostolic Palace where they all kind of gather dust, right? So, uh, look, Benedict is elected in April. I wrote my book in May. It comes out June 1st. Uh, I dutifully inscribed a copy uh, to Benedict, and then I gave it to uh, Joaquin Navarro Walls, who was a Spanish man at the time, still close spokesman, and promptly forgot it. Flash forward to August. Okay? Uh, my wife and I are back in the United States uh, on vacation. We're visiting, well, we, we just lost the last year of the time, it would have been my 93 year old grandma, uh, who lives out in rural western Kansas. Uh, I'll have more to say about rural Western Kansas a little bit later on, but for now, let me just tell you that in my opinion, uh, my grandma lived in the town that has the worst place name in America. It's a town called Hill City, and there's no hill, and there sure as hell is no city. <laughs> and we're talking like 700 people, but anyway, there we are in Grant County, America, uh, and my cell phone is. And you know how, even back in 2005, you could tell who was calling, right? Because your screen would be telling. So I, I knew it was Joaquin Navarro Walls. Uh, and I pick up the phone, and he says, Well, John, uh, I wanted you to know that uh, I'm on vacation with Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict had the habit of taking his vacation up in northern Italy near the border with Switzerland in the Alps. By the way, to cut note today, uh, 
every time he did that, no matter where he was staying, no matter how remote or kind of odd the location was, the Salesians always seemed to own a really killer chalet that they would make available for them. So here's my real estate tip of the day. Those of you who have Salesian friends, try to get in on their timeshare. Yeah? Really be worth doing. Uh, anyway, anyway, uh, so uh, Navarro calls and says, okay, so I'm, on, I'm with the Holy Father on vacation. And I wanted you to know, he came down to breakfast this morning with your book in his hands. And he asked me to pass on a message to him. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, okay, but if you've just been told that the Pope has a personal reaction to something you've written about him, I want to make sure your tray table is in a full upright and locked position. Okay? Because the skies may get a little bumpy. But I said, of course, what do you mean? That, that's Marcus. You know? Uh, what's the message? Now, to get this, you have to understand that my book was divided into thirds. Okay? So the first part was the final days of John Paul II. The middle part was the inside story of how Cardinal Ratzinger had been elected as Pope Henry. And then the last third were my projections for where his vacancy is going to go. Okay? So Navarro said, the Holy Father's message was the following. Please thank Herr Dr. Allen for having written this book, particularly the last part about the future of my papacy, because it has saved me the trouble of thinking about it for myself. <laughs> I like to think he was kidding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest that on this score, as in so many others, we take our cue uh, from the Holy Father of the world. Uh, that is, if we can take a clear-eyed look at the challenges facing us, the staggering, mind-bending challenges uh, of trying to make our way through this wildly, riotously complex global church of ours, and the harrowing reality of having to do it at the same time that a stunning chair of our sisters and brothers in the faith are literally running for their lives with the crime of being Christian. Okay, if we can take a clear-eyed, unblinking look at that reality, but if we can do it with a twinkle in our eye and with laughter on our soul, as opposed to rage in our hearts and vile in our spleen, then that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is a winning strategy for Catholic life in the 21st century, every day of the week and twice on Sunday.